So it's been colder lately, and I went out for a big run for the first time in a long time. So it was rough. So I was out there, and I was breathing so heavy. I was like freaking Miles Dyson out there on that trail. You know, I was like grabbing my stomach, and people are coming up to me. They're like, you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm so hungry. I can hold this. <laughs> it was pretty rough. Yeah, I remember those days. Yep. So what did you check out this month? Uh, okay, I thought there was going to be a whole story, but okay. Nope, that's it. I puked my guts out. <laughs> I watched It, but it was not the new version. It was not the Tim Curry version. It was not It, the Terror from Beyond Space, which is what I thought it was going to be. It turned out it was a movie from 1967 that I had never heard of before, starring Roddy McDowell as a guy that works in a museum who comes in possession of a golem that he figures out how to animate and... Of course, it turns out he can't completely control it, and it ends up killing a bunch of people and going out of control and fighting the military and everything by the time the movie's over. How did you come across this movie? Uh, it was on TCM, and the description said it was It the Terror from Beyond Space, but it wasn't. It was pretty much what you would expect from what I described. It was fine. It wasn't anything special. I wouldn't especially recommend it to anybody, but it wasn't terrible. The golem reminded me of Chief Woodenhead from uh, Creepshow 2. They both look kind of like just a cheap plastic costume that's supposed to look like wood or stone, but doesn't. The one thing that was really weird about it... I mean, well, first of all, I guess you have Roddy McDowell as the main character. Um, it kind of reminded me of Conga in that way, in the way that Michael Goff is the main character and he's kind of an asshole. He's kind of the bad guy of the movie, but he's the main character. Yeah, there's no kind of, there's no kind of about there. Well, yeah, it was kind of like that. But being that it's Roddy McDowell, you know, he's a very unique individual. And that really was the most interesting part of the movie was just watching him. But they decided to throw in, for whatever reason, a psycho angle to it where at the very beginning of the movie, right after, because the golem is introduced in literally the first scene, I'm pretty sure the very next scene is Roddy McDowell going home, talking to his mom for a while, and then the camera pans over, and it turns out his mom is a corpse. <laughs> and he just keeps her in his in his house or whatever. And it's it, I guess it's to set up that he's unstable or something. And I was wondering how the movie was going to get back to that, that plot point and explain that or anything. And it turns out it never comes up again through the entire movie. Nobody ever mentions it. It doesn't come back at the end or something. It's just there. It feels like maybe they had the movie already done. And then they said, well, we need to kind of get people a little more interested at the beginning. And just stuck in that one scene that has nothing to do with anything else. That's weird. Um, the rest of the movie, if it didn't have that scene, I would have said, well, it's just a typical kind of monster movie kind of thing. But yeah, other than Roddy McDowell... And that, there really wasn't anything special about it. I watched Ancient Behemoth in Ostrancevia from 2023, which I watched because it was called Ancient Behemoth in Ostrancevia. <laughs> so, in Ostrancevia was a prehistoric creature that lived before the dinosaurs. It was kind of like, if you imagine a saber-toothed cat, but a reptile. It technically wasn't a reptile, but that's kind of what it looked like. This was a Chinese movie. And China's been putting out a lot of these monster movies with a lot of CGI and stuff. And I, I usually don't watch them because I don't like CGI. But I was curious. I decided to check it out because I wanted to see uh, the image on Tubi didn't look anything like an Innostransevia. And it turns out the monster in the movie doesn't look anything like the image or like an Innostransevia. Um, I don't remember how they explained where it came from. There's some kind of genetic experiments or something. But basically, you've got this group of college kids, of dumb college kids, that go to this island on a vacation where a lot of people have died and they decide to go check it out or something. And it turns out there's this Innostransevia on the island or this monster. And actually there's more than one. There's an adult and there's a baby, but they use the same CGI model for both, which does not look good because infant versions of animals do not usually look exactly the same as the adult. So it was, it, it looked really dumb. So they just changed its size? Yes. Oh. It didn't work. And even the adult would change size between shots in the same scene to a degree that was distracting and weird. There is a part where they're running through a forest away from it, and it jumps at one of them, and somehow when it impacts the ground, it sends this... I can't remember if it was a guy or a girl, but it sends somebody up into the air somehow, and then it opens up its mouth, and the person falls into its mouth, and it just swallows them. <laughs> uh, like, already none of that makes any sense. But then, literally, the next, like, probably the next shot is it turning to the next person 
who's on the ground, and you can see that its head is about the size of the guy's leg, but somehow it just swallowed somebody whole. So that's the kind of movie you're dealing with. It felt like a sci-fi channel movie. The only thing that really, apart from being Chinese, and also I, I feel like the subtitles on Tubi had to be really off because there were things that, that really didn't make sense. Uh, but I don't think it would have helped the movie anymore to know accurately what they were saying. But the cinematography was good. It it looked like a real movie. It didn't look like a sci-fi channel movie, but then a CGI stupid-looking monster would pop out. And uh, the thing with the CGI, they went so far overboard with it that there are multiple scenes where things catch on fire, but they always do the fire with CGI. And they even went to the point where... There's a scene where they build a campfire, and instead of building a campfire, it's a CGI <laughs> campfire. It's, and it, the camera's pointing right at it, and it looks really stupid. Um, the acting was pretty bad. The characters were all really dumb. Uh, the movie ripped off Jurassic Park and The Host, the Korean monster movie. They, they ripped off the scene from Jurassic Park where they're in the kitchen with the raptors, and it was almost exactly the same. <laughs> I thought it was really funny that they, at one point, one of the characters finds out that the monster is sensitive to sound or whatever. They're like, it hunts by sound. But all the sounds that they're making are really loud, so anything would hear them. There are multiple scenes where the characters just stand there while the monster is doing stuff. It was it was pretty bad. Quick side note, speaking of Jurassic Park, I saw this trailer for this video game that hasn't come out yet that is basically you playing through the original Jurassic Park movie. Okay. Is it an actual Jurassic Park game? Yeah. And it's up to the point where the trailer steals shots from the movie, except you play as a different character. And it was really funny. I couldn't stop laughing because at the beginning, the character you play as in the cutscene says, this is so-and-so. I've been left behind in Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> Which was so funny. So the way they're saying the story of this game happened is the whole movie happened and this person just happened to be somewhere else. <laughs> I mean, it could have been one of the workers or something. <laughs> it's supposed to be one of the scientists. Okay. It was really, really funny. And to me, I said, you know what? If they were going to make a game about playing through the first movie, post-movie, it should be Nedry. <laughs> he, he should have survived somehow in the Jeep being attacked by the, the Lopithosaurus or whatever it was. <laughs> What was it? Dilophosaurus. Yeah. <laughs> See, I'm surprised I remembered it started with a D. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so he should have survived and like made it out, but be wounded. So you'd start the game and he would have lost his glasses. So you can't see really well and you're like limping and stuff. And with his programming <laughs> skills, you have to make it to different spots on the island because all the systems are isolated and you eventually have to get rescued. That would be awesome. Oh, man. <laughs> and he makes all of his stupid lines from the movie and quips. You know, like eventually he'll find mm. the one dude's rifle who got killed by the raptors, right? And he'll pick it up and you'll be fighting the raptors and he'll just be like, you didn't say the magic word. <laughs> and blow him away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I would play that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to make that game. I just have to get the licensing rights. Yeah, good luck. <laughs> so when you were talking about this movie, you equated it to a sci-fi channel movie. And I don't have cable anymore, but does sci-fi still make sci-fi channel original movies? Uh, I actually don't know. Yeah. That is a good question. So I wonder if there are people watching this. Who don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not that hard of a survey. I mean, it's like three people, so maybe they could <laughs> say yes or no. Yeah, and I remember I remember back when the Sci-Fi Channel first started making their own movies, and I looked forward to them, and I thought they were decent. Um, but then at some point, they basically turned into the TV version of The Asylum, right. and that was very unfortunate. All right, so what else did you watch? I watched Halloween 2, the one from 1981, not the newer one. Um, I had seen this movie before, but it was a long time ago, and it was on the Sci-Fi Channel, so everything was cut out of it. I guess I'll preface this by saying I'm not a huge fan of the first one. I get why people like it. It's just not my thing. I don't find it interesting enough. Um, I think my, my problem with it, I like Donald Pleasance. I like that whole side of it. I like the Mike, Michael Myers side. But the characters that you're actually following in the movie, Lori and her friends or whatever, they are so boring. And I just do not find that movie interesting on that side of things. And that's what the movie really is. The second one really carries that through for me. It kind of, um, I looked up some things, some comments that they made uh, that Deborah Hill, the co 
co-writer, and I think she was married to John Carpenter for a while, uh, some comments that she made, and she said, and I, I think this is a direct quote, In a thriller film, what the character says is often irrelevant, especially in those sequences where the objective is to build up suspense. And that's where they lose me. They're they're not trying to make the characters feel like characters. They're just trying to, you know, make the movie as a, a suspense movie, I guess. And I don't appreciate that. Well, I felt the second one, because it takes place immediately after the first one. Yeah, which was interesting. I liked that it that it was that it was so focused on what had happened right before. But the things I didn't enjoy about the first one just carried directly over into the second one. It almost felt like the first movie could have just been a four hour movie. Yeah. It it kind of made the like the fact that the first movie was its own movie feel like it didn't matter almost because it was like, well, it it's still the same it's still going, so it doesn't it doesn't matter what happened in the first one almost. What was the onus to create the second one was it just because the first one was so successful yes it was entirely a studio thing john carpenter didn't want to make another one um and i have a quote from him too where he says uh writing the second movie mainly dealt with a lot of beer sitting in front of a typewriter saying what the am i doing i don't know and that's what it feels like it feels like the movie just kind of is just going and even the whole thing i know a lot of people hate that the, the revelation of Michael and Laurie being sis, brother and sister. And it feels like it was something that they came up with late in the game because it doesn't, that revelation doesn't come up until late in the movie. And the start of it was so stupid where one character turns to Dr. Loomis and says, oh, I found a secret file that nobody knew about, <laughs> about Michael Myers. Let me tell you about it. And he's like, what? I'm the expert. I knew everything. And somehow somebody else, oh, it's so dumb. Not only that, but it turns out there was another scientist left on Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good comparison. I liked Dr. Loomis in the first movie. I didn't like him in the second movie. It felt like he was almost a parody of his character from the first movie because... His character in the first movie is interesting, and he, you know, he has all the insights, and he's being all mysterious about Michael, but they they, they expended all of that in the first movie. So in the second movie, it feels like they're desperately just trying to find interesting things for him to say, and it comes off as self-parody. It doesn't work. It feels stupid in, in this new context. And that's not even mentioning that he appears in practically every other movie after this one, too. Ah, uh, okay. I still... The only other one I've seen was H2O. Oh, and 3, I guess. Um, and H2O was terrible. And going off of the sibling relationship between Laurie and Michael, I think it's ironic that something that was just kind of thrown in haphazardly became the central piece of the Halloween lore. Yeah, I, I, I think it... I mean, because at the beginning of the first movie, you see him killing his... You know, you see him as a kid, and you see his family. I don't know. It just kind of raises too many questions. It does kind of answer why he would be so focused on Lori. I actually looked that up because I, I couldn't remember why he was following her in the first movie. And I guess he saw her drop something off at, at his house that he grew up in. And that's why he focused on her. I, I don't remember well enough and I, I don't really care to watch it again. But that would at least explain something. But the, it, just the way the whole idea was introduced felt like it didn't fit, didn't make sense. Just felt like some random thing to throw in to desperately try to make it more interesting. You know, I want to spin-off movie of the people who buy the Myers house because they pretty much just get murdered once Michael comes back but we don't know anything about them I would like to have a movie where they sit with their real estate agent and they have to do like the full disclosure yeah I mean since you've seen the other movies does that does the house become a like a thing like is that something like a like a thing that people talk about in the other movies yeah kind of and then it becomes a central location for a lot of them, where they're like, where's he going? And then Dr. Loomis will be like, back to his house. Okay. <laughs> Even though, I mean, like, there's no, it's it's just a house. There's no reason for him to do that. Right. It feels like they're just desperate to, to just give him a motivation, even at that point. I went through a stretch where I watched every Halloween movie, and I was always surprised in the opening credits to always see Donald Pleasance's name. I was like, man, again? Hmm. Yeah, what I like is the way every time that Jamie Lee Curtis is in one of them, they try to play it up as if that's a huge deal, but she's in, like, most of them, too. So, um, And I remember you talking a long time ago about doing a video on the Halloween movies. I didn't take good enough notes, so I have to do it again. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I rewatched Garth Marenghi's Dark Place because I was talking to somebody about it, and I was realizing that there were a lot of things she was talking about that I didn't remember. Um, I would still definitely recommend it to people. I didn't like it as much the second time. I wish even more that they had played things straight, but it was still really funny. And afterward, I watched 
Man to Man with Dean Lerner. Actually, I don't think I watched all the episodes of it yet, um, but it's kind of a spin-off. Uh, Dean Lerner is a character in Dark Place, and Garth Marenghi shows up in Man to Man with Dean Lerner. So Man to Man with Dean Lerner is a, it's like a fake talk show where Dean Lerner has a, a different person on each time, but they're always played by Matthew Holness, who played Garth Marenghi. He's just playing a different character in every episode. It's pretty funny. I would definitely recommend it. It is, again, I wish it was played more straight. I think it would have been better if they hadn't treated it so goofily. Um, but I, if, if you like Dark Place, I would definitely recommend that as well. I watched The Fall of the House of Usher, which was the Netflix show from 2023. It's eight episodes, one season. It's just a complete thing. It's the next miniseries or whatever by Mike Flanagan, who did uh, Haunting of Hill House, which I have started, but I'm not going to talk about that yet. Recently, I talked about reading a bunch of Poe stuff, so that's part of why I decided to check this out. I didn't actually know this was coming out until after I finished the Poe stuff. I was interested to see what they were going to do, and I came away very disappointed. It has almost nothing to do with the Fall of the House of Usher story or any of the Poe stories. All of the references to the stories feel shoehorned in and just sometimes sometimes the movie is really jumping through hoops to try to make it work to try to make those references work and it almost feels like the characters will turn to the camera and say hey did you get that reference it is very over the top and i did not like that aspect of it and it just accentuates how much the actual story doesn't have anything to do with the post stories so the idea is bruce greenwood is roderick usher he has this huge well, at the beginning of the show, all the rest of the family is already dead, and the show is kind of finding out how they died. And uh, so he had a big extended family, and each episode is kind of focusing on a different member of the family and showing how they died. And part of the problem with it for me, there, there are two problems with that, with that kind of structure idea. One of them is you already know that the characters are going to die at the end of the episode. And so each episode is just how did this character die? So you have to get through an entire episode to find out how they died which means in terms of the main storyline, getting to what's behind everything, you don't find out almost anything in each episode until the end. Um, so it feels like kind of treading water while you're watching it. And the other thing is all of these characters are unlikable by design. They're supposed to be despicable people, and they are, which means I don't care what happens to them. I don't want to follow them. I feel like I have no reason to watch what's happening. There's no, there's no point to get invested in anything. There's nothing to get invested in. All the characters have names of Poe characters, but none of them resemble any of their characters, any of the characters from the stories. There are times when they throw in lines of poetry uh, from Poe poems, and those, that was some of the cringiest stuff in there. When it's in a eulogy, that kind of works, that's fine. But when characters are talking and they suddenly stop and just start reciting poetry to somebody else as if it's just their normal dialogue, that doesn't work. It was really bad. They do that all the time. Uh-huh. Yeah, Shel Silverstein doesn't count. That's different. <laughs> <laughs> I will say Mark Hamill was cool. He was playing their lawyer, and he was doing a voice that I wouldn't be surprised if he's done it before or somewhere, but I had never heard it before. Um, I never I never think of Mark Hamill as an intimidating guy, but he was playing kind of an intimidating character, and it worked. It was really cool. I liked that, but I didn't really like anything else about the show. Uh, even from a horror angle, it feels like there's not a whole lot of horror content. It pretty much comes at the end of the episode, and everything up till then is just following these unlikable characters, you know, to the point that, you know, they're going to die. So it's it's just boring. There were, there were a few moments of humor that I thought worked, and of course they were the ones where they didn't play it up and point out that they're making a joke but then through the rest of the show whenever they do that they do exaggerate the line delivery and all that kind of stuff when it's supposed to be funny and it wasn't um in particular i don't know what the actor's name is but there's this one guy that pops up in other mike flanagan things and he he felt like he was supposed to be almost like a comic relief character and it it didn't work it was it was way over the top so i would definitely not recommend this show i watched godzilla vs kong from 2021 Oh, I had man. not seen this one before. It was directed by Adam Wingard, who did Your Next, which I liked, The Guest, which I liked, Death Note, which uh, the Netflix version of Death Note, I seem to be the only person in the world that actually liked it. Um, and then he did Blair Witch, which I thought was dumb. It was terrible. But overall, I, I, I've i liked what I've seen of him. Is this the one with Mecha Godzilla? Yes. Oh, yeah. So, have you seen this one? Yeah. Okay. So when it started out, the first, like, 10 minutes, maybe, I thought, okay, this might actually be a real movie. 
uh, from the start, I was thinking, okay, this is already easily the best American Godzilla movie by far. It seems at the beginning like the characters might actually be characters and they might do things. They might have motivations and, you know, personalities. Stuff might actually happen. Even Kong seemed to have somewhat of a personality. But then it just turns into another big, dumb CGI fest where... The characters are mostly just there to stare at things that are happening out of windows. Rebecca Hall's character is mostly there to look at what's happening and then to turn back to the deaf girl and look at her reaction and then the camera just cuts to her. It's You can predict the shots that are going to happen in the movie because it's the same thing over and over again. Who directed King of the Monsters, the one before this one? Uh, that was uh, Michael Doherty, the guy who did Trick or Treat, which I really like Trick or Treat. Yeah, all of these directors, the things that they did before they did these Godzilla movies were things that I liked. And then they did this Godzilla movie, and all of a sudden I don't really care about what they're going to do next. As far as the plot, nothing made any sense. All the characters were stupid and, like I said, mostly pointless. None of them had arcs. Uh, there, were, there wasn't even, not only were there no character arcs, but there were no plot arcs. Things just kind of happened. I think it was funny that the movie tried to tell us that somebody being very forceful meant that they had an arc because every character was very forceful in their beliefs even if those beliefs didn't make any sense and actually made things worse for everybody and they knew it would happen but they did it anyway yeah and the thing is with those beliefs that the characters have when they introduce them that's where it feels like oh i can see kind of what they're going to do with this character where they're going to turn it you know bring it around to something some kind of closure of something but then it just turns out that that's it's literally like they said this is the character we have to set up the character and that's it they they didn't do anything else with the characters in the movie but the more that they shout that somehow makes them have more character oh uh, yeah and the fact that there were so many of them too but most of them didn't do anything. Kong was the only one that it felt like they kind of tried to give him some kind of arc when he starts out on trapped on Skull Island or whatever. Uh, he's not happy. And then at the end of the movie, he's happy in the hollow earth, even though when he went there, all he did was get attacked by a bunch of creatures and stuff. I would think that's not a very happy environment. He ate one. He got a snack. He was eating on Skull Island, too. The, f the way they try to tie everything together with the whole idea of the Titans or whatever and the Apex Predators, I think I might have said this with the previous one, too, but if 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 the whole thing is about the each each one of them trying to be the Apex Predator or whatever, how how are there, there are so many of them, they're all fighting each other, how, how did that work back in the past when these creatures were apparently all over the world? I just imagine it's just monster fights happening literally everywhere you look. And they're all fighting to be the king or whatever. And that's going to be the next one. Oh, man. Um, and the, the previous movie ended with all those monsters bowing down to Godzilla or whatever. Yeah, that was really funny. That cracked me up. And then in this movie, I guess they're just all dead when the movie starts. I get trying to make the monsters have some kind of character to them. And again, that's something that this movie needed was character. But they made them feel like children. You know, like they have kind of semi-human characteristics but no actual depth to them. And it just makes them look stupid and cartoonish. You know, not just in the visual CGI way, but in the way that they act and the things that they do. And it's really dumb. And my big question was the bad guys. Well, I mean, I had a lot of questions actually, but the bad guys, why are they the bad guys? They're creating Mechagodzilla to help defend against giant monsters, but somehow they're the bad guys just because the movie tells you that. Yeah, because you look at something like Pacific Rim where they were doing the exact same thing, but they were the good guys. Yeah, I mean, in this movie, they, they kind of, they throw in the, using the King Ghidorah head or whatever, but that doesn't, why is that inherently bad? That doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And then Mechagodzilla, it's supposed to be kind of a big twist, I guess, when he comes to life or whatever, but it doesn't, it's just, it, well, besides being super predictable, you don't know anything about the bad guys and then they're just wiped out. And then now the bad guy that you're fighting is this robot that just came to life. Is being psychically controlled by a severed head. Yeah, that is not a character in the movie. It's, it basically is just a robot, but somehow that's supposed to be it's supposed to focus things and the way kong and godzilla they've been fighting through the whole movie and then at the end they just tell kong like oh godzilla's not the bad guy and somehow they're they're just like okay with each other at that point it doesn't make any kind of sense uh so yeah the movie i mean did, did you did you feel when it started that it that it might be okay and then it turned worse not really i mean based on having seen the one before it i didn't have high hopes yeah, I mean, I didn't either, but I was, I don't know, I was hoping it would, it would turn out differently, but yeah, it was, it was, I would still say it was probably the best American Godzilla movie, but it's still a piece of crap. I mean, I prefer to watch the old Godzilla vs. Kong over this. 
Oh, well, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I would definitely not recommend this movie to anyone. Yeah, if you're thinking of going to see it, just remember what they say. Rain and hail, cold and snow are good excuses not to go. <laughs> <laughs> see, I told you i do it. I just stick in poetry all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> Plus, you're saying go to see it as if it's in the movies, in the theaters, but this came out years ago, even at the point of this recording. I mean, hey, if it's raining outside, don't watch the movie. Even if it's in your house, just say, you know, it's raining, we can't watch this movie. I watched RoboCop the series, which was the live action series from 1994. This was a Canadian produced series. Was that the one that was split into four parts or whatever? No, that was a sci-fi channel one, I think. Um, that came later. I haven't seen that one. So the, the first episode of this one was adapted from what was originally a script for RoboCop 2. And when it started, I was actually, I don't want to say impressed, but it was much better than I expected. Is it closer to what Frank Miller eventually published as that comic? I don't know. I haven't read the comic. And I don't know if that's the, I don't think that's the script it was based on. I think it was based on a script from the guys that wrote the first movie. So... The satire that was entirely missing from 3 and that was way too jokey in 2 was much closer to the original movie in this show, but really only in the news segments. Everything in between felt like they didn't really understand what RoboCop was. It kind of felt like there was a like a disconnect between the people writing the show and the people actually making the show, because the people making the show felt like they were trying to make a semi-kid-friendly kind of action show, and that's clearly not what RoboCop is. They treated RoboCop almost just like a machine. It's like they forgot that the whole plot of the first movie from his perspective is him regaining his humanity. In here, he's he's super robotic. The guy that plays RoboCop is pretty terrible. It's really over the top. It, it did not work. They gave him a female cop partner that was very clearly meant to evoke Lewis from the first movie. I guess she was in the other ones too. Um, she was played by Yvette Niper, who was the female lead in Dr. Mordred. And I actually thought she was not bad. Um, she was bad at first when she was really trying to be Lewis, even to the point of chewing gum and, and just everything. It was it was really bad at first. Thankfully, they kind of let her turn into her own character a little more, or at least the performance turn into a different performance. But really, there is no depth to any of these characters. They brought in Murphy's uh, wife kid and even his parents and they pop up in multiple episodes they somehow get involved in multiple plots that was a little ridiculous of course none of them ever recognize him but they do the thing of oh my son would have really liked you and blah 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 and stupid crap like that with the villains they actually they had at least one recurring villain his name was Pudface, and he has a face that looks like it's made out of clay but you know by a child sculpted by a child and a lot of other villains that pop up, it felt like they were trying to go for like a Dick Tracy kind of thing where they're kind of goofy and ridiculous. And again, that doesn't really fit with RoboCop. It feels like they're trying to do something else, like they're trying to turn RoboCop into something else. Uh, the woman that voiced Rogue in the 90s X-Men was in an episode. Uh, there was a VR episode because, of course, it's the 90s. That one was really funny in unintentional ways. And they gave RoboCop a hologram woman sidekick kind of thing. Uh, in the first episode, I think it was the first episode, she's this worker, she's like a secretary or something at, at OCP or whatever. I, th I don't even remember if they call it OCP in the show, it might be something else. Somehow she gets absorbed into the computer system or something, so now she can, yeah, she can pop out from computer interface locations or something and help RoboCop. And it, it felt like they probably stuck that in there to make the writing easier later to have kind of ways of getting information and get from point to point, but they don't really use her that much. She just kind of pops up randomly and just talks to RoboCop a little bit. And the guy that runs OCP, they kind of tried to change the people in charge from being purely evil and greed-driven to being just kind of misguided and almost comical, um, almost like friendly. They, they kind of, uh, they end up kind of working with RoboCop sometimes, depending on what's going on. So it really felt like they didn't really understand the, the first movie or what it was trying to do. But again, the news segments, some of them were genuinely funny. There were some good little moments. And I just, I wish the rest of the show had that kind of, you know, again, the, the satirical humor in it. Um, it was a little bit too over the top, but it was still the best part of the show. And some of it was pretty decent, but I would definitely not recommend this to anybody. It's not offensively bad. At least I didn't think so. It's just kind of a 90s RoboCop show. It's, it's, pretty, you know, forgettable. So I would forget about it. I read Lagoon by Nnedi Okorafor. 
this was a, I guess technically it was a fantasy book, but I would describe it as a sci-fi book from 2014 because it is primarily about aliens landing off the coast of Nigeria. And it's almost entirely set in Nigeria and just kind of explores what happens when, you know, first contact is made with aliens. And it's it's not an alien invasion story. It, it felt like what she was trying to do... So going in, I thought she was from Nigeria and she was, you know, familiar with the culture there. And I kind of gave a pass to some of the weird storytelling things because I thought maybe that's how stories are told over there. But I looked her up afterward and it turns out she's, she's from freaking Chicago. She has family over there, but she clearly doesn't really... She's not as familiar with what she's writing about as she should be. And now that I know that... I really can see that she's just not a very good writer. The, the The prose itself was not great. Also, she's a she's some kind of professor of creative writing or something, so I can't imagine how, how bad her classes must be. It was not a good book. There are so many elements that she throws in. There are so many characters, and it felt like what she was trying to do was portray the kind of variety of people and things that you get in Nigeria to kind of open people's eyes to it over here, because it definitely feels like it's written for a western or even specifically american audience but she doesn't she throws in a lot of things in a way like a lot of uh references to nigerian mythology and there are even where the fantasy aspects come in is mythological characters start showing up at random points and for the most part will just show up for one scene and then never show up again without any explanation and the whole time that the book was going i was waiting to see how that was going to come together with the aliens and i thought there was going to be like a conflict between the two of them or something because the aliens they say they're just looking for a new home or something like that but they are mutating all the sea life at the start of the book you have there are three main characters who mostly don't matter but there are three main characters that are walking on the beach and they get kind of sucked into the ocean and later they start displaying that they have superhuman powers uh like super strength or they can i can't even remember what all they can do um one of them can kind of uh uh not manipulate people but influence people by by talking i think something like that and I thought that was going to be something that came from them being exposed to the aliens and being mutated or something. Because at one point, even uh, the main woman turns into like a fish, like a mermaid or something. And that was from the aliens. But it turns out their powers are not. They're just powers that they already had. And that is never explained. You get kind of flashbacks of when they first realized they had powers previously in their lives. It never gets explained. It never matters. And really, that sums up the book. There are so many random things that are thrown in here. And as it was going along, I was I was somewhat enjoying it very vaguely because I was very intrigued to see where it was going to go, how it was all going to connect. And it turns out it doesn't. And even the way it ends, she kind of says, oh, you want to know what happens to these characters, don't you? But it, it's, a, it's a giant spider talking that lives underground that weaves stories. And it, maybe if she had introduced that idea at the beginning, it would have worked better. But she introduces the spider very late. And it's almost like the spider is talking to the reader. And the spider says... You want to know what happens to these characters, don't you? You want, you want, this is me paraphrasing, you want closure to the story, don't you? You want arcs, you want things that actually happen, but no, I'm going to give you the Godzilla versus Kong experience, <laughs> and it's just going to kind of end, and it's just whatever, and none of it mattered. So, yeah, it was pretty bad. Again, I, I gave a lot of things a pass because I thought it was just kind of a cultural uh, disconnect but it turns out it's not. She's just not a good writer. I've been trying to listen to some audiobooks. I can't listen to fiction audiobooks. I can't focus on them, but I find that nonfiction uh, is okay. So I listened to the U.S. Marines on Iwo Jima, which was originally published in 1945. This is an account written by, I think, five different... They were in the military, but they were like... Uh, I don't know, not reporters, but they, they were, it was, it was their job to document what was happening basically, but they were also involved in the combat. And so it's basically just a lot of, almost just a bunch of anecdotes of what these people went through with a lot of other stories kind of being brought in from other people that were there. Um, so it's all real life stuff. It was published right after it happened basically. So if you're interested in firsthand experiences of fighting on Iwo Jima, you're going to get it from this. Um, given the time period, there are a lot of Japs being thrown around. Japs did this and Japs did that. But it doesn't feel like nowadays that's a racist term. And I, I know it was used as a racist term at the time as well sometimes. But in this case, it really does feel like it's just an abbreviation. Um, it doesn't feel like they're trying to be insulting or, or uh, you know, kind of talking them down or anything like that. And it's it was really interesting 
all the just the different things that happen and it really when i say anecdotes it literally sometimes it's just like this guy went into a cave and this happened and then it just goes to the next person and this happened and it doesn't it does kind of give you the over overall uh kind of like description of the island and kind of uh i wanted to find a physical copy too to see if there were any photos in it or anything so i don't know but but uh it was definitely interesting anybody who who thinks uh that sounds interesting i would definitely recommend checking it out i read we have always lived in the castle by shirley jackson which was from 1962 i've read that okay i'm curious to see what you'd say then i also saw the movie too okay i have not seen the movie i loved the haunting of hill house I didn't like this quite as much, I think, because this one intentionally doesn't give you all the information at the beginning. I feel like a big part of it, it almost feels like a mystery where you're kind of learning why the characters are the way they are. So you've got these two sisters living in a house that's kind of isolated and shunned with their uncle also who has uh, dementia or something. You're kind of trying to learn why, what happened to the rest of their family because you know they're all dead and why they're shunned by the community and for the most part it's kind of just following them as they go through a certain period of their lives almost um they have a normal uh cousin that comes to visit and of course that throws everything out of whack and things kind of spiral out of control but it's not really plot focused it's more character focused and kind of just going through the moments it's very atmospheric in a in a way that i really liked and a way that I guess is her thing because uh, it, it reminded me of the Haunting of Hill House a lot, especially the protagonist. Um, they felt different enough that they it didn't feel like she was doing the same thing again. But I can clearly see that she relates to very introverted, isolated characters that feel like they have trouble communicating and don't really interact with the outside world a lot. And I thought it was interesting that you don't find out everything over the course of the book. She leaves important things unexplained but not in a way where you feel like you're missing something. In a way where I do want more, I do want more information. And I do feel like if I went back and reread it, I would understand it better. So it it was definitely very good, but I did prefer The Haunting of Hill House. And it reminded me a lot, and I wasn't expecting this, of Spider Baby, the movie Spider Baby. They both have a pair of sisters that live in a house out in the middle of nowhere that's shunned by the community, that are suspected of murder. At least one of them acts much younger than she actually is. And both stories involve normal relatives arriving, which throws everything off, causes complete chaos, and kind of brings an end to everything. And Spider Baby was made in 1964, which was just two years after this book came out. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be surprised if this was a huge influence or even just the inspiration for that movie. I guess I hadn't considered that connection. Yeah, do you see it though, now that I'm saying it? Yeah, and, okay. you know, most movies could benefit from more Sid Haig. <laughs> I mean, that's true. <laughs> I thought the movie was well put together, too. I would recommend you watch that. Okay, yeah, I wanted to check it out. I, I found out about it after reading the book. I didn't even know there was a movie until afterward. Um, have you read anything else by her? The Lottery? Like, every single child who went through high school. Yeah, see, I didn't. And we went to the same high school, so I don't know. You were probably in the honors classes or whatever. I was. Thank you. Yeah. It's, I, I, well, I'm not going to go into that, but I purposely <laughs> avoided those. So I've talked about reading Doc Savage a bunch of times, and I had never read any of the Shadow stories, so I decided to read one of those. I read Crime Insured, which was from July 1937. This is the first book in the Nostalgia Ventures reprint line. It was written by Walter B. Gibson under the name Maxwell Grant. And I can say right away the writing was way better than the Doc Savage stories. Um, The second story in this volume is written by Lester Dent, who wrote all the Doc Savage stories that I've read. So I'm curious to see how, if his writing is any different in here. Apparently this is, it's, it's my impression that this is the most popular Shadow story, but I don't think it was a good one to start with. Basically what happens is some criminals find out... They don't find out who the shadow is, but they find out where his hideout is, and they they manage to capture a bunch of his agents. Um, I was really surprised. I knew that the shadow was a huge influence on Batman, and that some of the Batman stories are just ripped off directly from the shadow stories. So I was really surprised, given that Batman at that point was working alone. I was surprised at how much this this focused on the shadow's agents and how many agents he had, because he has a ton. There are so many characters in this book, and honestly, it was hard to keep a lot of them straight. Um, There are tons of characters on the good side and the bad side, and even side characters, some of which only pop in for a scene. 
but it was good because even when they popped in for a scene, they felt, they all feel distinct. They feel like, not fully fleshed out or anything, but they feel like real characters in the context of the book, um, to the point where I wasn't sure which ones I should focus on, which ones were going to be important, and it turns out a lot of them are not. But I would still call that a plus. The, the writing was good, overall. Um, I thought the action scenes could have been better. There are a few shootouts in the book, and I, I feel like they could have been better written. Of course, the kind of stereotypical image of the shadow is him dual wielding handguns, um, and I'm I'm I wonder why because these these were put out by the same people that put out Doc Savage, and they made Lester Dent tone down the violence in Doc Savage to the point where they're using rubber bullets, but the shadow is still allowed to kill people. So I don't I wonder why it definitely wasn't over the top in the violence or anything. So I I don't think it was a good one to start with because. I think the reason people like it is that the shadow is put on the defensive so much and that he's kind of discovered and rooted out and everything, and he's got so many people against him. But for me, I don't have any connection to the way he was running things before, so it doesn't have as much of an impact to have him kind of be figured out like that. I did find it interesting to learn that I always thought Lamont Cranston was his secret identity or whatever, but it turns out it's not. That's a that's a real person that exists in that world, and he just sometimes adopts that identity. Um, but I don't know if his identity is ever revealed in any of these books. Um, and even the people that are working with him, his agents and everything, they don't actually know who he is, which is interesting and just makes him more mysterious. And so the crime insured part was kind of funny. The plot from the villain side is this crime boss kind of guy has... He comes up with... The most ridiculous scheme, which is he's going to provide insurance for criminals. So they'll they'll come to him and say, here's the, the plot I want to carry out. Here's the amount of money that I intend to gain from it. And if this crime boss says, okay, that's a good plan, he'll insure them. They'll, they'll basically, if they succeed, they'll pay him like 10% of what they get or whatever. And if they don't succeed, he'll pay them the amount that they were hoping to get. So to me, I would think if you're a criminal... You would just say, oh, I have this plan, and then you go to him with the plan, and he okays it, and then you're like, oh, I guess the plan didn't work out. Where's my money? So I can see some obvious holes in it. And basically what happens is the shadow keeps foiling people's plans, so the crime boss has to keep paying them out, and he's like, oh, I got to do something about that, and then that's kind of how they end up going after the shadow. Um, So it wasn't bad. I enjoyed it, but it didn't blow me away or anything. I definitely didn't like it as much as the Doc Savage stories, but it did take me a few Doc Savage stories to really become a fan. So I feel like probably the same thing will end up happening with The Shadow. Um, Given that they were being churned out one a month, I feel like you're kind of supposed to just keep reading a bunch of them, and that's kind of how things kind of build up. So I'm definitely going to read more. I read Old Gods Anew, a companion to Jack Kirby's Fourth World by John Morrow with John B. Cook. So this is actually the 80th issue of the Jack Kirby Collector, but it was published as a book. And like it sounds, it covers the fourth world stuff that he did at DC, but it also goes into what he did before dealing with mythological characters like Thor and stuff and afterward and kind of explores his whole obsession with god beings and that kind of thing. So I really like everything The Two Morrows puts out, almost everything. They do really good magazines on comics. I have tons of issues of Back Issue and Alter Ego and Comic Book Artist and all all kinds of other stuff that they put out. So overall, this is really good. It has tons of interviews with Jack Kirby and Steve Sherman and Mark Evanier and other people. Listening to Jack Kirby, or I guess reading the things that he says, it's clear that he doesn't really have a firm grasp on what he's even trying to do. He's just kind of making things up as he goes along to a certain extent. Right. He seems to have, he has like deep ideas in a way, but they're not really solidified. Yeah, he's extremely creative, but it's a little bit scattered, which causes problems when he comes back to ideas years later and tries to continue because he doesn't remember what he was thinking back then. Yeah. Um, Did you, did you read this or no? No, I just, okay. I was in honors language arts, so I know. (laughs) (laughs) Learning about uh, the way... Hunger Dogs came about, and that final issue of that miniseries that they put out, it explains a lot of why it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. Like, Hunger Dogs originally was a shorter story that was originally, I think it was originally supposed to be the final part of that miniseries, but then they said, oh no, let's expand that. The editors, for whatever reason, said expand that into a graphic novel and then do another issue as the final issue of this thing. So it, it, it wasn't what he wanted to do. He was very unhappy with the way it turned out. So was I. 
Yeah, and he even, uh, the graphic novel was published at a larger size than the normal comic size, so he had to take the pages that were already done and then add stuff to the margins, which is part of why some of those pages look kind of weird and the, the, the lettering size changes and stuff like that. And then there was even an inker that went in and altered a lot of the inks to try to make them match. Right, because it wasn't his normal dude that he always liked to ink his stuff. Yeah, and uh, one thing that I didn't like about the book is it's way too, like, worshipping of Jack Kirby. It's like Jack Kirby could do no wrong, and, you know, if he had been allowed to do what he wanted to do, and I mean, if he had been allowed to do what he wanted to do, I'm sure it would have been, it would have been cool, and it would have been better than what we got, but it feels like they kind of are always taking his side in every possible argument of anything. And it's a little bit too much. Um, there is one section of the book that I thought was a complete waste of space, which is 365 days of Jack Kirby's Fourth World, where apparently it comes from an online blog somewhere where uh, every day this guy was doing an entry on a different Jack Kirby concept from the Fourth World just to show how many he came up with. And... It almost is just like a glossary, but I read these stories, so I already know what these things are. I don't need you to give me multiple pages and pages, freaking 365 entries of stuff that I already know what it is. So I just skipped over that. That was a waste of space. Um, but the rest of it is almost all interviews, lots of pictures. Uh, the way it's all put together is really good. I really like the formatting of all of their magazines. So yeah, I would definitely recommend it to anybody who wants to find out some background on the fourth world stuff. And it even goes into uh, the people that worked on the Fourth World stuff after Jack Kirby, but from a somewhat opinionated perspective where they're kind of trying to point out the things that, that, that they thought were the best, that I guess John Morrow thought were the best. Mm. And they use the word anticlimactic multiple times, but they spell it anticlimatic, which would be like anticlimate. So that, I, that really annoyed me. I don't know. It was really irritating. When it popped up multiple times, it was distracting, and it's clear that he doesn't know how to spell anticlimactic. I finished playing Breath of the Wild for now. Oh. I probably will go back to it at some point. I was surprised. I thought you were going to say you finished it, but then... No, no. I got tired of it. There was just too much of the same after a certain point, um, especially the climbing. There was just too much climbing in that game. It just gets kind of boring after a while. So I, I beat the camel, and I beat the elephant. And I think I talked about that even the last time I talked about the game. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I will eventually get back to it. I will try to at least complete the main storyline. I mean, you don't even have to go through all of the animals to complete the game. Yeah, but I would rather do that. I want to find the, uh, at least the, defeat those four, obviously defeat the main boss, and uh, find all the uh, the memories to get that kind of the story. But there, there are so many, I mean, in a good way, there are so many little things along the way um, that you can get sidetracked with. So I, I still think it's a well put together game. I just wish it had more of a more kind of momentum to it to keep you playing in terms of your investment in what's happening in the game as opposed to just playing it because it's fun. And after a while, the enemy variety really starts to get kind of annoying too because too many of them are too similar to each other. Um, I think I said before that I liked the enemy variety and I did at first, but as you're getting farther in the game, all they do is they make them harder Right. And it honestly gets kind of, I mean, you can just run past them if you want to, but I feel like then why are you playing the game? Um, so I, I fight most of them, but it ends up just, some of the fights just take too long. It's just like just doing the same thing over and over again. So I got tired of that. Um, it's just too repetitive. Um, but I, I still think it's good. So I started playing Skyrim. Have you ever played Skyrim before? I've played it before, but I didn't get into it that much. It was on my brother's 360, and I've never been an Xbox person. And it, I'm pretty sure his 360 probably broke, because all of the Xboxes always break. Thanks, Microsoft. Yeah. Even though they sponsor our videos. Uh, they don't pay us enough. I don't like this as much as the Fallout games. I'm not a huge fantasy person in the first place. I definitely prefer the... I, I mean, a big part of what I like about the Fallout games is the sense of realism from the perspective of I can imagine myself being in this world and behaving the way I would in real life. But Skyrim is a little bit more video gamey. Well, it's a lot more a lot more video gamey where you have all the magic abilities and it's just it's just there from the start and it's a big part of it. And I can see why that's fun for people, um, you know, having all these magic powers and that kind of thing. But personally I prefer something that's more realistic. Yes, Fallout is very over the top and goofy, but when you're traveling through the world and just walking around and stuff. It's it's a lot more tense to me. I know you're so excited for that TV show. 
it's, it doesn't look as bad as I thought it, it would, but I, I mean, I don't like Fallout for the story. I don't really care about that as much. Um, it's more the, the simulated experience, I would say. Um, and I am playing this, I am playing Skyrim on survival mode. And I, I mean, I do like it. Uh, I feel like I will like it more the more I find out about the world. I think part of another thing that made Fallout better for me was all the little stories along the way feel more developed, I think. Again, this one feels more video gamey. It feels kind of like, oh, go here and bring back my bring back this quest item. And uh, I don't know. It's just too, too kind of traditional, like almost like RPG generic kind of thing. And that just doesn't appeal to me personally as much. I'm just, again, I, I like my games not to just be fun games. I, I like them for, like with Fallout, for the experience of being in that location, doing what I'm doing. And the combat, I like the combat in Fallout a lot better. The hand-to-hand -hand combat just isn't as satisfying. I don't know. It's it's fine for what it is, and I still like it, and I'm going to keep playing it. Um, but I, I definitely don't get into it the way I did uh, Fallout 3 and 4 and New Vegas, which I, I never beat New Vegas, but I, I don't have my PS3 right now, so I can't play it. And that's everything I did this month. So what did you check out? I watched Cube from 2021, which was a remake, a completely unnecessary remake, to the 1997 Canadian movie Cube. Okay, I didn't even know about this. Probably because it was not very good. Yeah, I figured. The premise is the same. People wake up in a cube-shaped room connected to other cube-shaped rooms, and they find people, and they don't know how or why they're there, and they have to escape. And some rooms have traps that kill you. So the differences here are the people, obviously. But that also means that their backstories are different, which affects how they interact with each other, which is a big part of this movie, since the premise is so isolated. Unfortunately, these characters were not very interesting. They tried to expand on their backstories a little bit more, and add 1,000% more drama but it only kind of worked for one or two out of the whole group. And since we're in the future now, the cube has more futuristic traps and mechanisms. And the biggest difference is when they reach the supposed exit. And I'll ruin it for you, so if you're planning on watching this bad movie, A, don't waste your time, and B, don't listen to the next 10 seconds. The only one to make it out is the little kid, who has the most cliché, I don't know what's waiting for me out there, but now I'm stronger and I'm willing to face it, ending. Oh. And he says that to the only other surviving party member, who is a woman who barely talks throughout the whole movie and stands around with this wide-eyed stare. That's her character. <laughs> and it turns out she's not leaving the cube because she's a robot. <laughs> And she's been observing everyone else inside the cube for whatever reason. And then she goes back inside, and there's another group of people. And she's like, hey, does anyone know why we're here? And then the movie's over. Oh, man. So I cleansed my viewing palette by watching the original cube from 1997, which, for being such a simple idea on such a low budget, is not too shabby. With decent people behind the camera, things like this movie can work even if all the people in front of the camera are not stellar. Yeah. <laughs> I watched a movie from 2012 called Der Wand. I think that's how you would say it. I'm not German, clearly. Which was classified as a suspense movie, but it is anything but suspenseful. So a woman is out in the Alps with some friends, and they're in a cabin, and she wakes up one morning to find herself alone with just the dog because the other two people left to go into town. And she's out for a walk, and it turns out there's this invisible wall closing her in to a gigantic area, but she still can't get out. And she can see a few people outside from another cabin, but they're frozen, and she can't communicate with them in any way. So the movie becomes her learning how to accept her situation and what she does. And even though it's called The Wall, The Wall doesn't even really matter. After about the first 10 minutes, it is rarely mentioned again. The movie is focused on her. And the only characters are her, the dog, and eventually some other animals. And it's almost 100% narrated from journals that she's writing. And the entire movie felt like a documentary of her living out in the Alps. And she writes like an author. So the movie really felt like a visual book more than a movie. And it was a very German movie, if that makes sense. Very matter-of-fact statements, lots of almost nihilistic perspectives 
the inevitable, unstoppable forces of time and nature, that kind of stuff. Very existential and philosophical. Lots of really nice scenery, but you could leave this movie on in the background and treat it as an audiobook, I think. And even the ending, while containing one little hiccup, is very matter-of-fact, and then the movie is over. It was, it was an interesting thing to watch. Sounds intriguing. I think some people might find it boring. The people that like Godzilla vs. Kong. Yeah, probably. I watched Misery from 1990, which is a movie based on a Stephen King novel where an author, played by James Caan, wrecks his car out in the mountains of Colorado and he is rescued, but then imprisoned by his number one fan, played by Kathy Bates. Yeah, I talked about this just a few months ago. Yeah. He's injured, but she lies and keeps him there for longer than necessary and doesn't tell anybody that he's there. And eventually he figures out how unhinged she is and has to find a way to escape since everybody thinks he's dead. Kathy Bates is really good, and I think she won an Oscar for this movie, is that right? Yeah, I think so. And if Stephen King movies are good at one thing, it is not winning Oscars. <laughs> the book is much more violent, but the movie isn't wearing kid gloves either. The scene most people remember is when Kathy Bates breaks James Caan's ankles with a sledgehammer, which is pretty brutal. But personally, I think the last struggle they have is way more intense than that. When James Caan swings that typewriter down on her head and they're rolling around on the floor and he's jamming that burnt newspaper down her throat screaming, you f freak, and he slams that doorstop into her face. That whole sequence was so brutal. Like their acting was so good. Or maybe they just really hated each other. I don't know. See, that's the part of the movie that didn't work as well for me because I thought it was a little too much. She kept getting up too many times. I like how the uneasiness and crawling horror comes primarily from the performances. Like, there's not a bunch of over-the-top musical cues or weird Dutch angles because it's a horror movie. Most of the movie is pretty static, I would say. Kathy Bates is just really good, and she totally captures and delivers on that insanity. And even though she is crazy, she doesn't overdo it. I mean, she's a complete psycho, but she doesn't overdo it with her acting, which would have been such an easy trap to fall into. Yeah, she keeps her character relatable. <laughs> I watched The Adventure of Denchu Kozo from 1987, which is a Shinya Tsukamoto movie made two years before the release of the first Tetsuo, which is what he is most known for. This one is just as creative and weird and art filmy as his later stuff, and was also pretty damn entertaining. His recurring themes are on display here, like the merging of man and machine, as is showcased by the main character. So, this kid who because it's a Tsukamoto movie, has a giant electric pylon growing out of his back, <laughs> is made fun of by his peers, and he ends up traveling through time to the future. <laughs> of course. Where vampires, these three vampires, are using their machines to blot out the sun so they can be vampires outside all the time and presumably take over the world. And this kid runs into his girlfriend from the past, but now she's older because it's the future, even though it's the same actress, just with old people makeup on. And he has to use his unique ability of generating power through his pylon to stop the vampires. It is a really weird movie, but I really liked it. And it was another example, kind of like Cube, of how you can have practically no money, and I'll tell you, this movie had no money, and still make a very compelling end product. I think Tsukamoto's use of imagery and camera work really sets it apart from other low-budget movies. And I also found it very interesting that there's some humor injected throughout the movie, but straight intentional humor. Like Tetsuo has some funny stuff in it, but it's not as in your face. Like this is very much in your face. Some parts of it reminded me of other directors like Sam Raimi and Evil Dead stuff, but you know, his other movies do too. They all kind of share sensibilities that way. It was definitely worth watching. And speaking of Tsukamoto, I guess I didn't realize he was in Ichi the Killer, which you talked about last month, I think. It was a while ago that I talked about it, but yeah. He's also in Shin Godzilla, which I must have missed. And watch Pluto from 2023. Pluto was originally a manga by Urasawa, which was based on an Astro Boy story. And the manga is great. Like, really great. Definitely recommended read. Have you ever read it? No, I don't even know what this is. I'm not a huge manga person, yet. Pluto takes the original story and reimagines is the wrong word. Maybe recontextualizes? Maybe that's better. It makes me sound smarter, so I'm going to use that word. <laughs> 
but it takes the idea and fleshes out all of the characters, giving them more depth and personality, and turns the whole story into a murder mystery. And it brings in a lot more philosophical questions, while at the same time keeping the core of the original story. And it's really cool seeing these Astro Boy characters in such a different way, but written so well. And Adam himself is not the main character of the story. I was reading some interviews with Urasawa and how he felt adapting Tezuka's work. And he said, if you aim to properly adapt or remake any of Tezuka's work, you will naturally end up with a very dark story, which I tend to agree with having read a good chunk of Tezuka's work. Like all of the Astro Boy TV adaptations, both American and Japanese kind of lightened everything up. And when I saw Netflix had done an animated version of Pluto, I was hopeful but skeptical because you and I have both seen complete shit come from Netflix. And in terms of anime, modern stuff, there's always that huge chance that they're just going to cheap out. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, this was great. I am not sure how much it deviates from the manga, if at all, but I don't need to be prodded too hard to reread Pluto because it was so good. My only complaint is I wish they had had all of the characters speak in their native language because a lot of them come from different parts of the world. I really liked that aspect of that show 1899, which I talked about however long ago, and I thought it would have worked really well here too. The episodes are an hour long because this is a long form story. Trying to abridge it would have been a mistake, so I'm glad they gave it the time it actually needed to tell the story. Just really good storytelling. I watched Spy Kids from 2001. This is a Robert Rodriguez movie where two kids figure out that their parents are international spies and they have to rescue them. And it sounds like a recipe for a movie where you leave it on in front of your kids and you walk away. But I will admit that I will sit there and go through this movie, even though a lot of the plot points are exactly what you'd expect from a movie called Spy Kids. There's an actual story with actual characters and a decent message behind everything. And the movie just seems to give a shit despite being a family-friendly action movie called Spy Kids. And I think most of that is because Rodriguez is behind it. I can't speak for the later ones, because I know how he fizzles out on sequels sometimes, but I do enjoy this movie. I think the thing that surprises me the most, which is the case for most Rodriguez movies, is the cast that he's able to assemble. This one has Antonio Banderas, Carla Gugino, Robert Patrick... Tony Shalhoub, Danny Trejo, Alan Cumming, Terry Hatcher, Cheech Marin, George Clooney, Mike Judge. There's so many people in this movie. And I know there are four, maybe five of these movies now. And I've seen little tiny chunks of the later ones, and they did not seem very good. Yeah, I think Stallone is the main villain in one of them. And Ricardo Montalban is in multiple ones. <laughs> it seems like Robert Rodriguez is the kind of guy who can approach actors and say, Hey, I'm making this movie. Do you want to be in it? without much more than that. And they're just like, yeah. He knows how to give people, how to let people have fun with their roles, I think. And they all seem to have fun. There's this one scene in this movie that we've probably watched 25 times in a row that just kept cracking us up. So spoiler alert, if you haven't watched Spy Kids from 2001. I have not, so. Okay, well, Tony Shalhoub is the real bad guy. And the little boy spy has the ability to perfectly mimic anyone's voice, which is kind of a throwaway ability that seems like a shoulder shrug decision. Like, it doesn't really have anything to do with the movie. And at one point, they all trick Tony Shalhoub into this room because he thinks it's Alan Cumming calling him. And Tony Shalhoub turns around, and he realizes that he's been hearing the kid mimicking Alan Cumming. And then the kid just starts mimicking Tony Shalhoub, just echoing his lines back to him. And I don't know, it's 10 seconds out of the whole movie, and it's such a throwaway joke, but it hits my funny bone in just the right spot. Interesting. I watched a documentary from 2020 called Insert Coin, which follows key games and people from Williams, which later bought and took the Midway name. And the documentary covers some of their biggest hits like Mortal Kombat, NBA Jam, Smash TV, stuff like that. And it was a really good documentary. These days, there are so many shitty books and videos on video games, both modern and classic, that lack research, skill, knowledge, or all three. So it was really cool to hop into this one and find something that was so legit. And part of what made it really work, besides the people making it, knowing how to actually make a documentary, was getting to interview a lot of the people who were inside the machine back in the day and they want to talk about it. And I'm not just talking about developers or artists, but people higher up in the company. Like it was cool to hear the VP of licensing talk about getting the license for Terminator 2 when they were making that arcade game. And the CEO talk about his mindset while he was the CEO. 
And something that really irritates me in things like this is when the only interviewees they have are journalists, and that's partially in quotes because a lot of people slap that title on themselves. Yeah. Or authors, and there's also some quotes around that too, who either don't know what they're talking about or they just want to tell you their personal story or how they personally relate to whatever is being talked about. Yes, that annoys the crap out of me. That's for a blog post. That's not for a documentary. And I was very happy and engaged through this whole thing because that really didn't happen. Most of it was people who were actually working at Midway. My only complaint is the title of this documentary sucks. It doesn't tell you anything about what to expect. It's super vague. Even a subtitle would have helped. The fact that I stumbled into it was just lucky. I read a book called The Legend of Final Fantasy X, which came out in 2022, which is a book covering Final Fantasy X and Final Fantasy X-2, which, yes, is a dumb name for a sequel. And the X is Roman numeral X, and the II is an Arabic II. But the book was surprisingly well-written. It was split into these major sections. One was just a story of the games, which was kind of nice, because it was more detailed than, you know, a Wikipedia article, and it was very accurate. And it was just the facts. It wasn't the author's personal opinions about it. And it also saved me from having to play X-2 again, because... I did not really remember the story from that game because I wasn't a huge fan of that game. Another section focuses on the characters, which wasn't too long, which was good because I don't need a bunch of the author's personal feelings about the characters. I just want to read about the characters. There was a section covering the themes, and this had a lot of research put into it, which was nice. And it delved a little bit into speculation, but it was mostly fact-based. And truly, outside of actually sitting down with the people who created the games, the next best thing is using their words from past interactions and interviews. So that was pretty good. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff. And for games you really enjoy, or movies or books or whatever form of media, it's great to be able to get into the heads of the people behind it and see what they were thinking, what their influences were, what struggles they encountered, how they approached the project. There's a lot of that, which was cool. The book also kind of took a step back and looked at these two games from a bigger perspective and the context of what else was going on around those games at the time and how that influenced the development. Most of the opinionated stuff was in its own section, which I really appreciated. And this person actually knew what they were talking about, which helped. So I didn't mind it because a lot of the times that's the stuff I just try and get through as fast as I can because it's like, I don't really care what you personally thought about this. Overall, a really good read. And I know this publisher has other books, both for other Final Fantasy games and just other games. So I kind of want to check those out, even though I don't think it's the same author for all of them. I read a book of Caribbean folk tales that was published in 2022. And I've been looking up a lot of folk tales from all parts of the world because that's something that just really interests me and I just enjoy. And unfortunately, this book did not really deliver. I don't know if it was the stories chosen or it's just the stories from that part of the world don't do it as much for me. Or maybe just the telling of the stories by this author wasn't effectively done, but I really wasn't feeling it. For me, the spark of imagination wasn't as strong as, for instance, the stories I read from Norway. I mean, I'm glad I was exposed to these stories, but I'm just kind of moving on. I played The Last Spell from 2023 which is described as a rogue light tactical role-playing game, which it is, I guess. I'm not great at classifications like that. So that's what it is. You have a party of a few people, each time is totally randomized, and in each run, you're in this little town that is being swarmed by monsters, and you spend the day phase preparing, and then you start the night phase, and you have to survive until the next day, until that area is complete. And each character has weapons, armor, skills. You choose how they level up. All of that is randomized every run too. Your town has buildings that perform specific functions. You receive resources that you determine how to use. And it's a really hard game, but that is the intention. Like you're gonna get totally slammed in one run, but you pick up new skills, weapons, whatever, and those are accessible in subsequent runs. So you just gain a little bit of traction every time. There's active and passive bonuses you can use, and I'm enjoying it. I can't see myself playing all the way through because it's just going to be too big of a time suck, but I'm glad that I'm playing it now. And it seemed really, really complicated when I started. Like There's like 60 billion menus everywhere. But once I did a few runs, I pretty much had it figured out and figured out the play style I wanted to do. So that's another benefit. Like I could see tons of people just playing this game completely differently from each other. And since you're expected to do so many runs, there's no real negative to failing. 
And the last thing I'm going to talk about is Super Mario RPG, the remake from 2023. And I'm going to talk about this at length. So if you're not interested, <laughs> people watching this video, just subscribe, join our Patreon, leave your money, and you can go. <laughs> I was so excited when they revealed this game at the end of that Nintendo Direct, and I was not disappointed. This game, which I've talked about, the Super Nintendo version, sometime in the past. This game is a great beginner RPG, which is exactly how I played it back in the day. And at that time, I didn't understand the concept of fighting enemies to, like, gain experience and get stronger. I was coming off of a platforming background, so I avoided most enemy encounters, which meant that I did not make it very far until I figured out how it actually worked. In this version, there must have been some stat adjustments because this game was incredibly easy, and the original game was pretty damn easy too. And in this one, there's even a breezy mode, I think they call it, which supposedly makes it even easier. And this is not a long game. The main story took me about 10 hours, and that was still being pretty thorough in terms of exploration. You know, tack on another 5 or 10 hours for extra stuff, and that's your game. Part of what I like about this game is that there's very little filler. You're always moving to the next thing. Areas do not overstay their welcome. There's really not too much backtracking. And even when there's a little bit, you now have a fast travel mechanic, which makes it even less of a chore. In terms of remake only content, they added a few things. There's some post-game boss fight rematches. And I would have liked to see more of the creativity that showed up here, because some of these battles weren't just win, but rather you'd have to complete a certain objective during the battle, or there'd be some sort of time limit, or you would only be able to fight with one person. But on the other hand, I like that they didn't mess with the original formula too much. Really, the original is from 1996, and there are many people who never played it and probably never will. So it's good that you don't have to preface this game with, well, it wasn't like that in the original too much. Mostly the quality of life improvements were really nice. So the last post-game boss rematch was pretty funny and I'm gonna ruin it for people now because I know this video won't come out for you know another year so in the original the toughest optional boss is Culex which is a sprite that comes pretty much right out of a Final Fantasy game it's made exactly in that style so it's straight 2d and in Super Mario RPG it's like an isometric pseudo 3d view so it doesn't fit with the style but on purpose and he even talks like a Final Fantasy character his battle is done to the Final Fantasy IV boss music. And it's funny, it's completely optional. And in this remake, that battle is exactly the same. He's still a straight 2D sprite and everything. But after you finish the main game and you fight all the other post-game bosses and you face him again, he comes back and he's like, you know, I've discovered the power of the third dimension, so now you're truly f***ed. And then you actually fight a 3D <laughs> version of him, which was pretty funny. Overall, a handful of language changes were made for the remake, some of which made sense, some that did not. I get the localization was pretty Wild West back then, but for this remake, I wasn't on board with some of the changes that were made. In terms of gameplay, big game changes that come to mind right away. Item inventory is a lot different. Now, instead of only being able to carry a set amount of things, which was not that many, each item now has its own capacity, which was way better. And when we finally get an Earthbound remake, which I know you're working on, Nintendo, you cannot fool me. <laughs> I hope we get something similar for that, because that was something that kind of bothers me in Earthbound too. You can also carry over 999 coins, which is great, because it was so annoying to max out very easily in the old one. Just buying a couple things equaled over 999, so you just had to go grind to get more coins. It was kind of dumb. And there's a bunch of different battle mechanics. Aside from chaining timed hits, which give you little buffs, you also build up this meter for new triple attacks, which completely break an already pretty broken battle system. But something I felt could have been improved was the effects of equipment being more prominent. A bunch of pieces of equipment have secondary and even tertiary functions that are never explicitly stated in the old game. And people don't even know about them. You'd have to pretty much have a player's guide back in the day. It was almost like little secrets, although that's not knowledge that really needed to be kept secret. And I was hoping they'd open that curtain a little wider this time, but they didn't. So I would recommend checking the internet for what effects equipment has besides what the game shows you. And that can really make a difference, especially for some of those tougher battles. I did the main story, I did the post-game content, and I did most of the side quests. Back in the day, I did them all, just for the record. I did those hundred jumps in a row. This time around, I stopped at like 50. I said that's good enough. People who know this game know what I'm talking about. I did look the other way a hundred times to get the lamb's lure, which is... Such a dumb minigame. Hours that I will never get back. My whole life could have been different. 
<laughs> Had I not spent that time getting those perfectly timed jumps back in 1996, I could be having a discussion on a successful YouTube channel. But <laughs> that time has passed. <laughs> The music in this game is great. The original soundtrack is one of, if not my top overall video game soundtrack. This remake was also Yoko Shimomura returning to her original work, which was the best decision. She brought her modern compositional practices to these older tracks, which totally showed. And she finally discovered what a f***ing counter melody is. It's about time. <laughs> the map music is the most Kingdom Hearts soundtrack I've ever heard in my life. The forest maze is super mana-esque. And there are these little new sections in a lot of tracks before they loop again. And something cool like in the battle music, as you get more chains, it adds more percussion to the track, which is cool. And the arrangements are pretty much all really good. It's fun listening to because her style used to be so much more bouncy and unapologetically energetic. And over time, it's become more emotional and thematic mainly due to the games she's worked on and the overall style of just games in general. So it's really fun to see her return to that older version of herself. And even back then, the structure of pieces was much more straightforward, with less time to get the mood and point of a track across. It was just like, do it, straight up. The original soundtrack had such a warm sound, and being so late in the console's life cycle really allowed her to milk those chips for everything they had. And there's a few tracks that I felt lost some energy of their original counterparts. And for a soundtrack that was so percussion and bass heavy, both of those things were really toned down. But there were some tracks that just cracked me up and really benefited from her current composing practices, like the arrangement of the sad song, which is now called Elegy because we're in the future. You can swap the music between original and modern at any time, which is really nice. But the new arrangements are so good that I never really felt tempted to go back. Story-wise, it's the same game. And for those who do not know, this starts as a typical Mario adventure, but turns into something completely unique, character and story-wise, very quickly. Almost none of the content that is original to this game has been seen in anything else since... The original was really late, Super Nintendo, and the last thing Square did with Nintendo before jumping in bed with Sony for the PlayStation. And since a bunch of the original characters and content is Square owned, that's really the reason why this game has stood alone for so long. I haven't looked at the price of Super Nintendo carts, but I know that it was really low for years, which always baffled me because it's such a good game. And I'm sure it's higher now because of this release. But really, this remake does such a nice job, you don't really have to play the old one. But I will say there's probably been a resurgence of traffic on a bunch of old GameFAQs threads from like 15 years ago. And I'll admit, I took advantage of certain technological advances. There's that one part with Dr. Topper where he tells you to count all the barrels in the room and he only gives you 10 seconds. And I was like, I'm going to take a screenshot. <laughs> Some things were actually much easier, like Knife Guys Find the Ball game, because the ball was forced to move smoothly now because back in the day, they actually like skipped frames to make it appear faster than it was. Ah, oh, that was so frustrating. <laughs> Piece of shit knife guy. <laughs> yeah, so it's not a long game, but it's a very good game. There's really clever writing. There's good pacing, kind of except for the end. Good humor, good music, quick gameplay, lots of small distractions and mini games along the way. And even after playing the remake, the booster arc is still just my favorite part of this whole thing just because of outlandishly goofy it is. It's just so absurd. It's the point where Square said, okay, this whole arc is completely original, all non-Nintendo stuff, and we're just going to run with it. So that's all I did this month. So we're trying really hard to get caught up on these. Okay, I'm going to point out I'm caught up. We stitch these together. We each edit our own halves. Well, I've been sick. And I understand you're doing Buffy. And that. And all my freaking Japanese crap. I don't know where this will get announced, when this will come out. I'll probably end up saying this on some other video to explain before this comes out. But I will be moving to Japan early in 2024. And I feel like that's going to be a big obstacle. So I will especially need that Patreon money to sustain me over there. <laughs> I mean, that could work out in your channel's benefit, though, because you can meet Godzilla in person. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens. I'll have I'll have the inside scoop on some of the weird Japanese stuff we talk about. I would recommend not hitting any pedestrians with your car, especially metal fetishists, because then you will be infected by a virus that will slowly turn you into Tetsuo the Iron Man. Yeah, but then they'll make a movie about me. I don't know. It's a trade-off. I don't, I don't know which is the better option. 
So thanks for sticking with us another month. And sorry for all the delays that keep happening. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> well, most of them are not your fault. <laughs> So yeah, we definitely appreciate everybody's support in whatever way it comes. Even if you're just watching our videos, leave it playing in the background, leave the whole playlist of all of our videos playing in the background and go to work and then come home and play it again when you're going to bed. <laughs> Get us all those views. <laughs> Thanks for watching.